Welcome to Airy TV English News Broadcast, dear viewers. I'm your reporter, Basaba Tagla, following other major headlines for today. 30th anniversary of Eritrea's referendum for independence. Activities carried out in connection with May Day 2023. U.S., U.K. and European Union announce new sanctions against Iran's IRGC. And Turkey detains 110 people over alleged Kurdish militant ties. On your local reports, the 30th anniversary of the referendum for Eritrea's independence was observed yesterday, 24 April, at the United Nations headquarters. The event that was organized by the Office of Eritrea's Permanent Representative at the United Nations was attended by Mr. Samir Sanbar, the Special Representative of the UN Secretary General for Eritrea's referendum, over 100 ambassadors and diplomats of various countries, as well as a number of nationals residing in New York and friends of Eritrea. Ms. Sofia Tesfamariam, Permanent Representative of Eritrea at the UN, explaining the significance of the event in the Eritrean history commanded the guests for the honor and their interest to join the celebratory event. In his virtual message, Mr. Usman Saleh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, said that Eritrea's legitimate war of national liberation launched when its inalienable right to decolonization was denied, was callously ignored by most countries and strongly opposed by the major global powers. And even when the country was formally annexed in 1961 by Ethiopia, by Lateral abrogating the UN imposed Bagus federal arrangement. Minister Osman Saleh went on to say that the historic event occurred almost 43 years after the UN adopted Resolution 390 AB to federate Eritrea with Ethiopia, denying its people independence and forcing Eritreans to opt for a costly armed struggle to assert their independence after all peaceful avenues were closed to them. Mr. Samir Sanbar on his part expressed honor for being part of the historic referendum that happened 30 years ago to decide the independence and sovereignty of Eritrea and to share his experience about the event. Noting that the process reflected the true desire of the Eritrean people for independence, Mr. Samir Sambar said that the warm hospitality of the Eritrean people still lingers in his mind. In their messages of good wish, the ambassadors and representatives of Nicaragua, Singapore, China, Russia, Ethiopia, Uganda, Rwanda, Pakistan, Syria, Democratic Republic of Congo, Morocco, Tajikistan, European Union, African Union, as well as the UN, said that Eritrea's referendum for independence was conducted with strong participation and organization of the Eritrean people and was an exemplary referendum process. At the event, short video clip about the process of the referendum that was carried out from 23 to 25 April 1993 was presented. On your last local report, the National Confederation of Eritrean Workers carried out various activities in connection with International Workers' Day 2023 under the team Clear Vision Concerted Work. The activities that started on 5 April included construction of terraces and preparation of holes for planting tree seedlings at Dembe Zaul, blood donations, seminar related with labor and productivity, workshop as well as general knowledge and literature competitions. Accordingly, Mr. Walde Jesus Elisa, Director General of Labor at the Ministry of Labor and Social Welfare, conducted seminar on 18 April focusing on future work opportunities and challenges. Mr. Walde Jesus indicated that technological development, green economy and demographic change are the basic parameters for the future employment opportunities. 
Mr. Welde Yesus' father said that long hours of work, short-term contracts, low payments and shortage of policies and security of profession and health, as well as unofficial employment, are among the challenges that could be encountered in the future. Mr. Welde Yesus said that the Eritrean government, based on the national charter, macro policy and labor law, has issued laws and guidelines with a view to ensure all citizens have efficacious work. Workshop on culture of production and productivity was also organized on 20 April. Furthermore, 456 employees from 19 institutions conducted construction of terraces and preparation of holes for planting tree seedlings, while 110 employees from 16 institutions voluntarily donated 100 units of blood. And now we'll be back with your international reports after the short break. Welcome back. The U.S., U.N., Rather, the U.S., U.K. and the European Union on Monday toughened their sanctions against Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, or the IRGC, as part of new restrictions on Tehran. British Foreign Secretary James Cleverly announced a travel ban and assets freeze on four individuals and the IRGC in its entirety. Brussels added eight individuals to its sanction list, as well as mobile operator Ariantel. James said the ban was made in coordination with the European Union and the U.S., which have both ratcheted up their curbs on Iran in recent months. More than 70 Iranian officials and entities have been made subject to U.K. asset freezes and travel bans since October last year. The bloc has targeted more than 150 individuals, companies and agencies. In response to previous restrictions, Iran has imposed its own sanctions on the U.K. and the European Union in a tit-for-tat move. Turkish police detained 110 people over an alleged militant ties, security sources said on Tuesday, with a pro-Kurdish lawmaker saying tens of politicians, lawyers and journalists were among those arrested in raids that he linked to elections on May 14. The security sources said the operation was focused on Diyarbakir, the largest city in mainly Kurdish southeast Turkey, and extended over 21 provinces, targeting people accused of links to the outlaw Kurdistan Workers' Party militant group. The operation came less than three weeks before presidential and parliamentary votes that represent the biggest electoral challenge President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has faced since his party first came to power in 2002. On your final report, submarines from Russia's Pacific Fleet destroyed a mock enemy object as part of a naval drill in the Sea of Japan, the news agency Interfax reported on Tuesday. Two diesel-electric submarines conducted a tactical anti-submarine exercise in the Sea of Japan to search for and destroy a mock enemy submarine, the agency said, citing a statement from the fleet's media service. The submarines used a training torpedo to attack the target, the agency added. The project, 636 Varshavyanka submarines used in the drills, are part of a Russian class of diesel-electric attack submarines known in the West as the improved kilo class. The TASS news agency reported that six of the submarines would be built for Russia's northern fleet in the Arctic. The vessels are 74 meters long and can cruise up to 7,500 miles. You're still watching every TV viewers and now recap of the major headlines. Thirtieth anniversary of Eritrea's referendum for independence. Activities carried out in connection with May Day 2023. US, UK and European Union announce new sanctions against Iran's IRGC. And Turkey detains 110 people over alleged Kurdish militant ties. Dear viewers, that was it for today. Thanks for watching.